Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction by Ursula K. Lippmann, 1986. In the temperate and tropical regions where it appears the hominids evolved into human beings, the principal food of the species was vegetable. 65 to 80 percent of what human beings ate in those regions, in Paleolithic, Neolithic, and prehistoric times, was gathered. Only in the extreme Arctic was meat the staple food. The mammoth hunters spectacularly occupied the cave wall in the mine, but what we actually did to stay alive and fat was gather seeds, roots, sprouts, shoots, leaves, nuts, berries, fruits, and grains. Adding bugs and mollusks netting, or snaring birds, fish, rats, rabbits, and other tuskless small fry to up the protein. And we didn't even work hard at it. Much less hard than peasants slaving in somebody else's field after agriculture was invented. Much less hard than paid workers since civilization was invented. The average prehistoric person could make a nice living in about a 15 hour work week. 15 hours a week for sustenance leaves a lot of time for other things. So much time that maybe the restless ones who didn't have a baby around to enliven their life or skill in making or cooking or singing or very interesting thoughts to think, decided to slop off and hunt mammoths. The skillful hunters then would come staggering back with a load of meat, a lot of ivory, and a story. It wasn't the meat that made the difference, it was the story. It is hard to tell a really gripping tale of how I wrestled a wild oat and seed from its husk, and then another, 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 and then I scratched my nap bites. And Ool said something funny, and we went to the creek and got a drink and watched newts for a while. Then I found another patch of oats. No, it does not compare. It cannot compare with how I thrust my spear into this titanic hairy flank white oob impaled on one huge sweeping tusk, writh screaming and blood sprouting everywhere in crimson torrents, and boob was crushed to jelly when the mammoth fell on him and I shot my unerring arrow straight through eye to brain. The story not only has action, it has a hero. Heroes are powerful. Before you know it, the men and women in the wild oak patch and their kids and the skills of the makers and the thoughts of the thoughtful and the songs of the singers are all part of it, have all been pressed into service in the tale of the hero. But it isn't their story, it's his. Virginia Woolf wrote a heading in her notebook, Glossary. She had thought of reinventing English according to a new plan, in order to tell a different story. One of the entries in this glossary is heroism, defined as botulism. And hero in Woolf's dictionary is bottle. The hero is a bottle, a stringent reevaluation. I now propose the bottle as hero. Not just a bottle of gin or wine, but bottle in its older sense of container in general, a thing that holds something else. If you haven't gotten something to put it in, food will escape, even something as uncombative as and unresourceful as an oat. You put as many as you can into your stomach while they are handy, that being the primary container. But what about tomorrow morning, when you wake up and it's cold and raining and wouldn't it be good to have just a few handfuls of oats to chew on and give little oom to make her shut up? How do you get more than one stomach full and one handful home? So you get up and go to the damn soggy oat patch in the rain and wouldn't it be a good thing if you had something to put baby oom oo in so you could pick up the oats with both hands? A leaf, a gourd, a shell, a net, a bag, a sling, a slack, a bottle, a pot, a box, a container, a holder, a recipient. The first cultural device was probably a recipient. 
Many theorizers feel that the earliest cultural inventions must have been a container to hold gathered products and some kind of sling or net carrier. So says Elizabeth Fisher in Women's Creation. But no, this cannot be. Where is that wonderful big, long, hard thing, a bone, I believe, that the ape man first bashed somebody with in the movie and then, grunting with ecstasy at having achieved the proper murder, flung up into the sky and whirling there, it became a spaceship, thrusting its way into the cosmos to fertilize it and produce, at the end of the movie, a lovely fetus, a boy, of course, drifting around the Milky Way without, oddly enough, any womb, any matrix at all. I don't know. I don't even care. I'm not telling that story. We've heard it. We've all heard all about all the sticks, spears and swords, the things to bash and poke and hit with, the long hard things. But we have not heard about the thing to put things in, the container for the things contained. That is a news story. That is news. And yet old. Before, once you think about it, surely long before the weapon, a late luxurious superfluous tool, long before the useful knife and axe, right along with the indispensable whacker, grinder and digger, for what's the use of digging up a lot of potatoes if you have nothing to lug ones you can't eat home in? With or before the tool that forces energy outward, we made the tool that brings energy home. It makes sense to me. I am an adherent of what Fisher calls the carrier bag theory of human evolution. This theory not only explains large areas of theoretical obscurity and avoids large areas of theoretical nonsense inhabited largely by tigers, foxes, other highly territorial mammals, it also grounds me personally in human culture in a way I never felt grounded before. So long as culture was explained as originating from and elaborating upon the use of long hard objects for sticking, bashing, and killing, I never thought that I had or wanted any particular share in it. What Freud mistook for her lack of civilization is woman's lack of loyalty to civilization, Lillian Smith observed. The society, the civilization they were talking about, these theoreticians, was evidently theirs. They owned it, they liked it, they were human, fully human. Bashing, sticking, thrusting, killing. Wanting to be human too, I sought for evidence that I was. But if that's what it took to make a weapon and kill with it, then evidently I was either extremely defective as a human being or not human at all. That's right, they said. What you are is a woman, possibly not human at all, certainly defective. Now, be quiet while we go tell the story of the ascent of the man hero. Go on, say I, wandering off towards the wild oats with Oo in the sling and little Oom carrying the basket. You just go on telling how the mammoth fell on Boob and how Cain fell on Abel and how the bomb fell on Nagasaki and how the burning jelly fell on the villagers and how the missiles will fall on the evil empire and all the other steps in the ascent of man. It is a human thing to do, to put something you want because it's useful, edible, or beautiful into a bag, or a basket, or a bit of rolled bark or leaf, or a net woven of your own hair, or whatever you have, and then take it home with you, home being another large kind of pouch or bag, a container for people, and then later on, you take it out and eat it or share it or store it up for winter in a solid container or put it in the medicine bundle, or the shrine, or the museum, the holy place, the area that contains what is sacred, and then the next day you probably do much the same again. If to do that is human, if that's what it takes, then I am a human being after all. 
fully, freely, gladly for the first time. Not let it be said at once, an unaggressive or uncombative human being. I am an aging, angry woman laying mildly about me with my handbag fighting hoodlums off. However, I don't, nor does anyone else, consider myself heroic for doing so. It's just one of those damn things you have to do in order to be able to go on gathering wild oats and telling stories. If it is a story that makes a difference, it is a story that hid my humanity from me. The story the mammoth hunters told about bashing, thrusting, raping, killing about the hero. The wonderful poisonous story of the botulism, the killer story. It sometimes seems that the story is approaching its end, lest there be no more telling of stories at all. Some of us out here in the wild oats amid the alien corn think we'd better start telling another one, which maybe people can go on with when the old ones finish. Maybe. The trouble is, we've all let ourselves become part of the killer story, and so we may get finished along with it. Hence, it is with a certain feeling of urgency that I seek the nature, subject, words of the other story, the untold one, the life story. It's unfamiliar. It doesn't come easily, thoughtlessly to the lips as the killer story does. But still, untold was an exaggeration. People have been telling the life story for ages in all sorts of words and ways, myths of creation and transformation, trickster stories, folk tales, jokes, novels. The novel is a fundamentally unheroic kind of story. Of course, the hero has frequently taken it over that being his imperial nature and uncontrollable impulse to take everything over and run it while making stern decrees and laws to control his uncontrollable impulse to kill. So the hero has decreed through his mouthpieces, the lawgivers first, that the proper shape of the narrative is that of the arrow or spear, starting here and going straight there and thuck, hitting its mark, which drops dead. Second, that the certain concerns of a narrative, including the novel, is conflict. And third, that the story isn't any good if he isn't in it. I defer with all of this. I would go so far as to say that the natural, proper, fitting shape of the novel might be that of a sack, a bag. A book holds words. Words hold things. They bear meanings. A novel is a medicine bundle, holding things in a particular powerful relation to one another and to us. One relationship among elements in the novel may well be that of conflict, but the reduction of the narrative to conflict is absurd. I have read a how-to write manual that said, a story should be seen as a battle, and went on about strategies, attacks, victory, etc. Conflict, competition, stress, struggle, etc. within the narrative conceived as carrier bag, belly, box, house, medicine, bundle, may be seen as necessary elements of a whole which itself cannot be categorized either as conflict or as harmony, since its purpose is neither resolution nor stasis, but continuing process. Finally, it's clear that the hero does not look well in this bag. He needs a stage or a pedestal or a pinnacle. You put him in a bag and he looks like a rabbit, like a potato. This is why I like novels. Instead of heroes, they have people in them. So when I came to write science fiction novels, I came lugging this great heavy sack of stuff. My carrier bag full of wimps and klutzes and tiny grains of things smaller than a mustard seed and intricately woven nets, which when laboriously unknotted are seen to contain one blue pebble. An imperturbably functional chronometer telling the time on another world. And a mouse's skull full of beginnings without endings, of initiations, of losses, of transformations and translations, and far more tricks than conflicts. Far fewer triumphs than snares and delusions full of spaceships that get stuck, missions that fail, and people who don't understand. 
I said it was hard to make a grippling tale of how we wrestled the wild oats from their husks. I didn't say it was impossible. Whoever said writing a novel was easy? If science fiction is the mythology of modern technology, then its myth is tragic. Technology, or modern science, using the words as they are usually used, in an unexamined shorthand standing for hard sciences and high technology founded upon continuous economic growth, is a heroic undertaking. Herculean, Promethean, conceived as triumph, hence ultimately as tragedy. The fiction embodying this myth will be and has been triumphant. Man conquers Earth, space, aliens, death, the future, etc. And tragic, apocalyptic holocaust then or now. If, however, one avoids the linear, progressive, times-killing arrow mode of the techno-heroic and defines technology and science as primarily cultural carrier bag rather than the weapon of domination, one pleasant side effect is that science fiction can be seen as a far less rigid, narrow field, not necessarily Promethean or apocalyptic at all, and in fact, less a mythological genre than a realistic one. It is a strange realism, but it is a strange reality. Science fiction properly conceived, like all serious fiction, however funny, is a way of trying to describe what is in fact going on, what people actually do and feel, how people relate to everything else in this vast sack, this belly of the universe, this womb of things to be and tome of things that were, this unending story. In it, as in all fiction, there is room enough to keep even man where he belongs, in his place, in the scheme of things. There is time enough to gather plenty of wild oats and sow them too, and sing to little Oom and listen to Oom's joke and watch news, and still the story isn't over. Still, there are seeds to be gathered and room in the bag of stars.